Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Okay, ready. Hello, everyone. I know you're watching us and sorry for the technical difficulties. You know how these things are. Um, and welcome to this webinar. Um, my question before we start to the audience, to you who are listening to us, it's do you like writing? Have you tried sometimes and thought you wanted to be better at it? Or you were interested uh, in it and then you thought it, that would be a good chance? Or are you interested and worried about environmental issues and maybe it's something you want to change and do something about it? Then you are in the right webinar and we have lined up a, set, a great set of speakers to help you write and communicate on sustainable lifestyles. So welcome everyone. I'm just gonna give you a brief uh, introduction and then I will just pass you on to them because they are the stars here today. Um, this webinar is organized by several organizations. Um, first of all, by CITSE. CITSE is an umbrella organization uh, for Catholic development agencies from Europe and North America and manages a very interesting campaign called Change for the Planet, Care for the People, which encourages living simply, reducing energy consumption, making sustainable good, uh, food choices um, in order to minimize the environmental impact. Um, so I would recommend you to check it if you don't know it. Um, we are also here with the Global Catholic Climate Movement, which, which works within the Catholic Church to better care for our common home. And their founding document is the famous, and I'm sure you know it, uh, Laudato Si, wrote by Pope Francis, the encyclical that talks about climate change and, and ecology. Um, and also myself, I'm from Climate Tracker. Um, Climate Track is a network of more than 10,000 young communicators in more than 150 countries that want to bring climate change issues to the media worldwide. So you can see how all these organizations wanted to do a webinar on how to communicate uh, sustainability issues. Um, for those who are watching and are really interested in this, you can take notes, of course, but afterwards you re will receive an email with something we are gathering, which is a journalist toolbox and you will have all the comments that, um, that they are giving our panelists and all the things that they will be telling us. Plus the recording will be available so you can, I don't know if you have any technical difficulties or if we have to leave, you can also retake us later. And last but not least, I, I'm sure you see here a very cool chat. Um, you can send questions during this panel and at the end I will be taking them. So you just, open the box that says chatting or something like this and I will be seeing them and directing them to the speakers uh, at the end of this at the end of this webinar. Okay but now to the speakers thank you very much for joining us I'm gonna introduce all of you and then of course pass it to you for the presentations. Um, we have among us Joel Borden he is an hour winning author and journalist he has traveled around the globe to cover and report in the relationship between humans and the natural world and is a frequent contributor and senior editor, former senior editor of the uh, environment section for the National Geographic. So he covered many of the environmental issues of our time and some you can see in his new book, um, The End of Plenty, The Race to Feed a Crowded World, where he talks about the food crisis, something that may be of interest to you. We also have with us Adam Corner. He's the Climate Outreach Research Director and an Honorary Research Fellow at the School of Psychology in Cardiff University. And he leads uh, the research portfolio of climate outreach, directs its collaborations with academic partners, and leads a very interesting project that he will be explaining us, which is the Climate Visuals Project. Um, he also out lead authored several books and writes regularly in, in magazines and media like The Guardian or The New Scientist. Moving on, we also have here Marta Isabel Gonzalez Alvarez. Um, she has a PhD in Media Sciences uh, at the Journalism uh, and Journalism, sorry, and, and is a lecturer in different um, universities, including uh, the Catholic, Catholic University in San Pablo de Madrid or the Fundación Crónica Blanca and has published several scientific articles on how to communicate um, different issues. She has a long professional experience 
um, on communications, uh, especially she has been the press officer and communications manager um, in different development NGOs. And she will talk to, uh, to us about this now. Like her work currently is at Manos Unidas, which is Stitz's partner in Spain, and she leads the communications department. So it's, it's gonna be part of her presentation to explain us her work there. And finally, and I promise I will stop speaking, um, I have with us Caroline Bader. She is the director of the Multiphase Sustainable Living Initiative with Green Faith. Um, it's a global interfaith organization that works on environment and climate action. So tries to amplify uh, commitments around energy, diet, transportation within the global community of different faiths and um, tries to promote practices that are also lifestyle related. Um, she has a great experience uh, attending the UN climate negotiations, um, so has learned a lot about them as well, and holds a diploma in religious education and community development and a certificate of advanced studies in international organizations for, by the University of, of Geneva. Um, so yeah, with all these impressive uh, curriculums, um, I hope you remember them all. I'm gonna just give the floor to Joel, who will tell us about tips and inspirations for reporting on sustainable lifestyle. The floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, especially speaking with some people who are really working in the trenches on this important issue to the planet, uh, uh, both the developed and the developing world. Um, you know, I've been covering the environment now for about 30, gosh, 30 years or so. Uh, and it's gone from one of sort of uh, air pollution, water pollution, um, pesticides, this sort of thing, to really having climate as being this overarching subject that affects everything. And uh, as a guy who covers the energy industry quite frequently. Uh, it seems to me that's kind of the nexus uh, to approach this, uh, this story. Um, energy is what drives us, it's what heats our homes, it's what uh, you know, cooks our food, um, but it's also what is cooking the planet. And so whether we're talking about water use and, and cattle rearing or, um, or you know, how climate is affecting uh, desertification in parts of the world that were once great uh, grain baskets, uh, all of this sort of has a, a climate uh, footprint now or fingerprint. So as a journalist, I feel like it's my job to sort of tease that out since there's been so much disinformation about climate change being put out by the fossil fuel industry over the last two decades. Um, is to sort of clear the air, if you don't mind the pun, and really uh, show people sort of what the implications are. What happens when there's a drought in sub-Saharan Africa? You know, what happens when California goes up in smoke uh, in this uh, Central Valley, which is a prime vegetable growing area for the rest of the United States. So climate change can be a very esoteric topic, but when you get it down to the things that actually matter to people, the food they put on their plate, the jobs they have, the way they educate their children, uh, it becomes uh, quite critical that, um, that they become climate aware. So that's been, that's been my task for the last few years years and um and just you know happy to answer any questions anyone might have on that and the journalism evolved thank you joel i'm not sure this was all your presentation you wanted to share with us if so, we can just move on to the next person and then come back to you with questions. I'm not sure if Adam was possible to be back here. He had some problems. And no, it's not here. Okay, so we had some problems with Adam, so I will jump to the next person. So I'm introducing here now Marta Isabel, who will tell us about communicating sustainable lifestyles in campaigns. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, webinar that I think is very important and we need to, to share information from, the, from our profession, from our communication and journalism. And I have a presentation to share and I would like to, to put um, a link also in the chat, which is the, the drive for uh, everybody who wants 
to download my presentation, the slides, and to maybe uh, review some information that I that I uh, will share. Uh, so I I, I go with. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, thinking about the the question, and I would like to uh, I, I would like to bring uh, I have bring uh, have brought, uh, I, I, uh, everything is working. You you can see the the presentation, isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, I would like to to expose my my uh, my view from the NGOs communication department because I think that the most important thing or the first important thing is to different the work from the departments in the NGOs and from the journalists. I think it's a different kind of your, of work that we have to do, and for me it's really important to to remark this situation. No, the, we have a, a work to do from our departments, uh, communication departments, that not, not every NGO has uh, right now a communication department, uh, almost in Spain, I don't know, internationally we have more department, more communication department, but I think it's uh, something that we have to improve in the third sector and uh, obviously in our organizations. So I have prepared this presentation and the first thing that I would, uh, would like to, to share with you is that I have uh, thinking, the first thing is connect with people, with our, with our audience. It's uh, something that we usually do wrong, is that we, we usually think in us, not in the people that are uh, uh, receiving our messages. It's something obvious, but we have to remark that we have to, to connect with people. So the first thing is connect with people. Uh, secondly, I would like to share some information and examples that we have done, the, the, the work that we have done with journalists, how we can share our information and press releases with, with journalists, uh, how can we spread out our messages about Laudato Si or whatever campaign, uh, whatever work campaign that we are um, working on. Uh, and finally, I would like to the, my own view is something that we have to be the, the source of the information. Also us, the, the communication, because we are always talking with people, so we, not, we need to be consistent. We need to be reliable, okay? First of all, I would like to, to go uh, quick <laughs> because we, we have only 10 minutes, but you can, you can uh, use the, the slides wherever. Uh, the, I, I, I think that we have to be almost like a Sherlock Holmes. We have to investigate. We have to do our research about people, about audience, open ears, read some magazines, interest, because we, we want to know exactly what interest, what kind of interest, what kind of languages uh, uh, people are using nowadays, know in the past. We have to know our audience. I know that uh, young people is something that we are thinking about. Uh, we have to be um, where, where the people are. The first of all, we have to, to use the, the same language, the same uh, style, and for that I think we have to be like Sherlock Holmes. Is that, is that we have to, um, to know what kind of series in, in Netflix are they watching, uh, what kind of messages are they spreading out and sharing about in, in WhatsApp, what kind of messages uh, uh, are they uh, using also and sharing also in, in Instagram. And if you, if you have a, a quite a, a short review and a short uh, uh, research about this, you can, share, you can find that people are um, talking a lot about food, so, uh, talking about uh, talking lot talking a lot uh, about uh, nature and about uh, uh, things that we are uh, especially focused on. Second part is that uh, we have to work with journalists. We are journalists here in EOS, but we have to work every day with journalists in media. For that, we have to sell them news. We are not selling them messages or something that 
uh, ideas. No, no. People, uh, the journalists in media, need news. So we have to try to convert our stories, our messages, our campaigns in news. Something interesting, something different. We have to do something like extra. We have to really surprise the mass media about our messages. They are not involved about the nature, about the uh, global warming. They are not uh, naturally uh, connected with that kind of, of questions that we in NGOs we are really uh, used to working that, but the mass media we have to the, the mass media has to be interested in that. And for me, is one of the most important thing to do here, from from journalist to journalist, from the journalist to the, the uh, in NGOs to the journalist in media. I have brought some uh, uh, examples with me about the questions that we have worked here in Manos Unidas in Spain. And also with CITSE, um, uh, we have started the, the campaign that uh, Anna explained before. Uh, we are involved in a campaign which is called uh, Change for the Planet, Care for the People. And we started in, in COP21 in Paris. And we were, uh, we were there with a young, uh, a, brown, uh, a young people group from uh, many places in Spain. And we have to convert that also in a new. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we have done a press release and, and campaigns also in, in networks. Last year also we have uh, another event uh, in Portugal. And finally, uh, a, camp, a camp about sustainable, international sustainable camp in Portugal. And we uh, link it uh, with uh, a, a work for change, uh, a kind of pilgrimage to Fatima. Uh, coincidence with the visit of the Pope and all the the events that that they they have done they have done there in Fatima uh, for the for the miracle uh, I don't remember the <laughs> centenary I think uh, from the uh, Fatima. Uh, finally, this summer we have uh, done a, a kind of uh, quite similar to the to the camp uh, of the of Fatima. Here in Spain we have uh, done the our first sustainable camp for youth people here in Manos Unidas. It was in, in Castellón, but this is not a really important new. But we, uh, we were there, uh, 23 people, and you can, you can ask yourself, what is the new here? Okay, we, ha we have created a decalogue. I think if you, have, if you write your press release, with uh, something new and something that is a decalogue, no? You have 10 um, uh, tips, uh, really easy to, to share and really easy to, to memorize. And it, does, it's, it's, it was the, the thing that we have done. We have created a new from an event that usually is not a, in really important. It was in summer. Summer is a good time for, for uh, mass media because we usually people are in, in holidays. So we spread out the press release and we were in, in many, many uh, um, media here in Spain, uh, important uh, media uh, agency, press agency. Um, we really do uh, a really good effort for, uh, for transform that event in a new, okay? Uh, also, the, the other things that people need uh, actually a lot is stories. We are journalists. We are always telling stories. We are uh, storytellers. So uh, also in uh, Change for the Planet, uh, Care for the People, we have done a really good effort. Now we are involved in, in energy, but the last uh, year we were in really involved about food and about uh, many things of uh, different uh, stories from experiences and reflections about um, people taking simple and meaningful steps for from sustainable sustainable living. Um, in this campaign, we have uh, many examples. We have postcards uh, with uh, examples for for half a, a simple life, and we have we have also stories of change. Yeah, stories of change is a quite of a, a mix of ten little stories um, about people. Normal people who who do who who usually change uh, their lives, 
they are examples from one uh, bishop, no, one, uh, sorry, one a parish in, in London, a, a, a housewife in, in Portugal. They are normal people, normal people who, who do um, things, little things that they are changing, but they, they are changing the world. It's something that, that is new, something that, that are uh, little videos. Uh, it's not really it's not really long, so short videos, and uh, we share about um, the press, uh, the mass, uh, mass media also. We uh, also have a, a contest, a, pic, a photography contest, and uh, here in Spain we take everything from the campaign and we create a new. Because we we need uh, to 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 sell to sell. Uh, uh, let me let me use that that argot, uh, journalist argot, which is selling selling the stories. No, we create the um, exhibition here in Spain in many cities from uh, uh, Castellón, Valencia, and we create an event an event with the stories, and we uh, we show also in a in a kind of. Uh, 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 meeting uh, the the documentary because we have we have created a, a complete documentary with ten stories. The ten stories. Finally, uh, is the the thing that I would want to share is that we here in Manos Unidas and in every kind of uh, of uh, NGO that we are we want to be reliable. We want to be uh, like uh, uh, we have to be um, we have to be a consistent source of information for the journalists. Uh, I think kind of they shoot the messenger is is the opposite. We have to be like um, we are. I, I think that we are in an age of fake news. We we are looking. Uh, everybody are looking in for for people to trust. Um, if if we use our networks. I can't. I, I have brought some examples for, uh, of my WhatsApp. Uh, I think that we are reliable when we are changing our lives. I'm using th that's a picture of me. We, I'm using my my bike. It's not a it's not a, a sticker that I put in myself. That I'm I'm a believer. I am a believer, and I have to be reliable. I'm I'm reliable when I am a believer. It's something that uh, you can easily check in the in the information of the journalist that you are talking with uh, that's uh, some examples of my Twitter I'm really concerned about climate change so I share my messages about climate change it's not a sticker it's on some examples that I have to that I want to to, to bring this afternoon and other examples is the the about La Dato Si and the last uh, the last uh, uh, meeting that it was in Vaticano uh, last summer, or maybe the climate change, the the the, uh, the systemic change. Um, we are involved. If we are um, a journalist that we are involved in that things, it has to be uh, exposed in our uh, social networks, in our life, in our WhatsApp. I think it it helps. To spread the message. In conclusion, how to create journalists who cares the sustainable lifestyles from NGOs communication department. Connecting with you is connecting with audience. Working with journalists in is mass media uh, using their um, uh, tasks and being a reliable font of information or source of information. Uh, as Thank you very much. I think it's a little more longer. Sorry, and I have to. Um, Thank you so much. That was very interesting. And I really agree that we have to make news out of our campaigns or out of our actions. Because of course, if not, media won't take them. So thanks, that's very, very nice. Um, I think Adam is back, so I can bring now him in. Um, Adam will uh, tell us how to visualize sustainable lifestyles. Yes, hello everyone. And I'm very sorry for the technical problems. I've shifted to a different room and I'm on a different Wi-Fi network. So I hope this one works. 
thank you for your patience. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm the research director at Climate Outreach and uh, we are an organization that, that works on climate change communication and we draw on um, social research, psychology, social science research, and we do our own research and we, we apply that to a range of different um, practical challenges faced by campaigners or other climate change communicators. And a lot of the work that we do is around language, but um, one major project that I've been um, leading for the last couple of years is called Climate Visuals. And I'm gonna talk about visuals and imagery today. And it starts from the, the, the idea that climate change has an image problem. And we could talk about that for a long time and what that might mean. But just as one example of what I mean, when you type climate change into Google, into an image search, what do you get? You get uh, polar bears, melting ice, kind of cracked earth, um, some strange kind of composite images of the earth, maybe burning. And what you don't see much of is like ordinary human stories of what this means for people in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and given that climate change means something very direct and tangible to so many people now, we're, we're living with the impacts. We see, we see those terrible impacts as well as positive developments and changes and, and, and solutions being developed everywhere. Then we need to see that reflected in the visual language for climate change. So, so the climate visuals program that we developed was a response to this challenge. Um, and we, we carried out some research to develop an evidence base for this decision that people make hundreds, maybe thousands of times a day around the world, which is what image should I use to illustrate my story for a journalist or as a, as a photo editor, or what image should I use to illustrate my campaign as, a, as an NGO or communicator? And I guess the, the, the core of it is we're, we are advocating for a more diverse, more compelling, more human focused, more urgent visual language for climate change that, that really does justice to, to the fact that it's such a crucial human story and not just about landscapes and nature and animals. Although those things are important, we need to see the, 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 the human faces. So, so we, we carried out some research in three countries with around 3000 people, um, three surveys, um, and some discussion groups. And from that research, we published it in, a, in an academic journal, and then we put together a report which summarized the, the, the key findings from the research. Um, and we, and we've, we got it down to like seven principles, seven, seven principles that follow from the research, which give guidance and advice for communicators to use when they're using photographic imagery to engage with public audiences on climate change. And um, I'm not going to go through all of the principles. I'm just going to focus on two of them. But they, 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 they really have to do with showing authentic everyday people, trying to ground climate change in people's everyday lives, you know, sh telling new stories, telling local stories, um, you know, evoking human emotions as, and, and getting away from the, 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 the cliches of climate imagery. So I'm just going to focus on two because they relate to sustainable behavior the most. So the first one is about how to show, I guess, how to show people doing positive things. Um, we, we tested a whole range of different images of, of, of people going about sustainable behaviors of different kinds or, um, you know, um, engaging in kind of climate solutions of one form or another. And we found that, you know, people did want to see ordinary people in these images, but they wanted to see people like authentic people doing normal things and not, not standing around and clapping and smiling and waving, but actually getting on with things. Um, so this image in the middle here is, is a good example of that of someone looks like real work is going on, someone said in our discussion groups. Um, and whereas the, the image on the, on, on the right of, of the kids and the solar panels, it made people feel happy, made people feel positive in our survey. Um, but we also got some pushback on it. Like people said, okay, this is a bit gimmicky, a bit staged. So there's an interesting thing to consider there, I think, for, for campaign images and for, for journalistic um, imagery around how we kind of show sustainable behavior, positive behavior, but in, a, in an authentic, credible way that doesn't feel like people are just posing for the camera. Um, this is the other side of behavior, I guess. Our, the third of the seven principles, uh, as I said, I'll just, just pick out two, um, is, is like, how do you show the individual causes of climate change? You know, individual behavior contributes to climate change as well as sustainable behavior being an answer to it. And, and again, there's some interesting stuff in here, I think. Like when we showed people or people in our research 
images that just had like individuals or families who were um, eating meat or driving. We got some negative kind of responses to that. People said, no, that's normal. We should, you know, that's just a normal family thing to do. That's not climate change. We can't stop that. But when we show essentially the same thing, but at scale, so a really busy highway, congested and dirty, or factory farming that really shows the scale of meat eating on the environment, we got like a really different reaction, really different emotional reactions. Um, people saying, yeah, it makes me want to change my behavior as well. So I think that's two sides to the, to the equation of showing, showing sustainable behavior or unsustainable behavior in imagery, which are, which are important to think about. Um, but but this wasn't you know this wasn't just a research project. Um, what we did with this with this piece of work, which is 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 something really new, I think, is we developed a website climatevisuals.org, and this is a library of climate images that are is completely searchable. It's got impacts, causes, um, solutions. Um, there's a whole a whole collection of images on individual behaviour in there, which you can find. Uh, we've, we've built up the library through partnerships with photo agencies. So some of the li images link back to the, to the agencies where the photos have come from. And some of them are creative commons. So some of them are free to use if, if it's not for um, commercial usage. But there's, but there's now quite a big library of images there, um, which we, 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 we know is, is, is being used by people around the world, including journalists and photo editors. Um, and at the moment we're getting really good feedback, but we're always open to hear more and, and, and ways that we can make it more useful to people. Um, but you can, you can read about the research. You can see for every image, how it links to the research findings, why it's there. Um, and the like suggestions for using it as well as how to, how to link to the original of the image itself. Um, it's just a few more examples there of people. Yeah. People, people doing things in response to climate change, I guess, or going about their lives um, that you can see real human stories being told um, in, in, in different places around the world um, rather than those, those kind of posed or stock more stock images, I guess. Um, just a few thoughts to, 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 to finish on um, some challenges, I guess, uh, of, 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 of how easy or hard it is to, to show sustainable behavior in imagery. And I think it can be quite hard. Um, many, many individual behaviors are quite kind of mundane or even invisible um, or, or even quite private, I think, actually. So like you might say, we can take a shower instead of a bath or take a short shower, but we're not gonna have a photo of that um, that's likely to be around for anyone to share. So um, there's a question about how do you actually visualize these behaviors that happen behind the scenes or in people's private lives? Um, there's also a kind of question about how do you show in an image people not doing something? Um, so like avoiding waste is good, but if you just show people where the waste would have been, but it's just nothing, then, you know, that doesn't very clearly communicate the message. So that's another challenge, I think. And, um, and some images don't easily exist, I think is, is fair to say. Um, like sustainable diets, how to eat a kind of more low carbon diet. We've done lots of searching around that and, you know, other than sort of shots of people eating vegetables, which isn't very clear again, um, it's quite difficult to, to show this kind of thing in action. So, so it isn't straightforward to, to position um, sustainable behavior in an image, but um, it, is, it is possible. And that's just a yeah, screenshot of, of the collection of individual behavior images we've got on climate visuals. And, and, and we very much develop this resource to be useful to, to people who make decisions about how to visualize climate change. So we'd, we'd love to, we'd love to um, think that this can help you all in your work and do let us know if there's anything that we can, we can help further with. Um, thank you very much. And I will stop, stop sharing my screen and hand back. Thank you, Adam. That was super interesting. And actually, I think we could all start sharing pictures of ourselves on Twitter, eating carrots and see if we change something. No, that, that was very good and, and very good reflections. Um, let's move into the next panelist. Um, bringing now in Caroline Butler, Butler, who will speak about leading the change initiative as a potential source for stories. Go ahead.
Karen, I think you are muted, so you will have to <laughs> mute yourself and start again. Hello Sorry. and welcome everyone. Can you hear me now? Wonderful. Great. So greetings to you from Germany and um, I do hope that you can see my screen, but I have also shared in the chat bar for all participants the, um, the direct link to the presentation as well as our website and contact. So you can also follow on that and that one if it's a bit too small um, for, for reading well. So um, Living the Change is a multi-faith sustainable living initiative, which I'd like to present to you. It's designed to support and um, celebrate people of faith who are making personal behavior changes in three areas, transport, home energy, and diet, um, which all have the highest impact on climate change if you look at personal lifestyles. And um, that was just shared by, by the other colleagues as well. We are a co coalition of religious and spiritual um, organizations and we work together with spiritual leaders um, and scientific experts on sustainable consumption, working with CITSE for example, working with climate outreach, so it's great to see so many um, great colleagues on this call today. Um, we do have nine implementing partners in this initiative who in total represent 1.3 billion people of faith in 150 countries. So the potential and um, possibilities are actually quite enormous if you look at um, the reach of um, faith communities and we have here um, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, Jewish and multi-faith partners in this first year of the campaign. Why do we work with spiritual communities? Um, we, we know that at least 84% of all people uh, on this planet identify with some faith or spiritual traditions and the values and models that they share actually do support sustainable living. We just have to, to, to dig a bit into um, the different uh, uh, scriptures, values and traditions of these faith communities to make that more visible in our communication. We also know that the, the infrastructure is quite, is quite amazing. So house of worship exists in nearly every part of the world and is actually really creating an outreach to grassroots communities and an infrastructure that is reaching billions. So we think and we believe that no other sector has greater potential for transforming consumption habits, which we, very, um, which, which we absolutely need. Um, other benefits of this work is that it really starts with us, starts with our values, and it's the call to practice what we preach. Um, and that's why we have created and designed this unique campaign of faith communities to strengthen each other. Why does sustainable living matter? I think all of you work on sustainable living, so I don't have to go into too much detail, but you all know that from the, uh, from the last IPCC special report on the 1.5 degrees, um, it shows clearly that we need solutions at scale. We do need political and economic, economic change, but also personal lifestyle changes. So it also is the question of how we actually live. And we do think that faith, community, faith communities have many answers to offer there. Um, we have done some research on which um, lifestyle choices matter most and have come up with um, the three high impact actions, or not we have, but scientists have come up with um, the actions of transport, energy and diet. We do think that faithful choices matter and we want to speak of a flourishing world, not of a, of a doom and gloom scenario. We want to actually um, remind, remind people of the, of the possibility that a good world is possible for all. And we try to do that through our communication and our program. How is sustainable living embedded in faith and values? We found that faith-based engagement actually needs to look different than previous um, and other environmentalist behavior change engagement. Because it always starts with our faith. It starts with the scriptures, values, and the existential questions of being human and being part of creation, as well as our different faith traditions and rituals that focus on lifestyle and how, what we define as a good life and a good relationship with creation, for example. Think about Lent, think about Ramadan, and many other religious seasons. I would like to show you a short video um, of two minutes um, that sh share some um, quotes and some faces of people who are part of Living the Change and who have done transformations to, 
sustainable lifestyles. So let me share this with you and I hope that you can hear and um, see everything. me is the driving force Sorry, one faith for me is the driving force in most of my decisions that i make in life as a muslim we believe that uh the quran says that uh we have to walk uh, gently upon the earth the laudato si encyclical is an urgent call to action to transform the way we live the way we walk in this earth as an evangelical i believe that taking action on climate change is right down the center of what it means to be a Christian. And I think it's my responsibility as a Christian to be in solidarity and to take care for my climate neighbor, which is my brothers and sisters all over the world. Es ist nicht morgen, es ist nicht in der Zukunft, sondern es passiert jetzt. The difficulties are that we are often captured in structures that are very hard to break out of. Sé que es un problema que mis hijos in the medida in que crezcan van a tener que lidiar mis nietos, mis nietas. Ich muss irgendwas tun, weil ich persönliches Gefühl hatte, ich kann nicht mehr so weitermachen. If we don't do anything, nothing will change really. We move towards a more plant-based diet, which is the diet of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Trying to use the bicycle as much as possible. To consume food that is produced in my vicinity. I'm going to make a concerted effort to go vegan. And so I am working to personally reduce my carbon footprint. It gives me a sense of support. It makes me feel like I'm part of uh, a community and a loving universe. It's joyful to see the transformation promised in the gospel manifesting itself in my life through the way that I live and the choices that I make. And so addressing climate change is an issue of goodness, it's an issue of sattva. Thank you, and I, I hope that you were able to, to all see this. Um, I could not read the comments at the same time. So, um, yeah, you will see that this is slightly different language than what we use maybe in the environmental movement or in a political um, um, context. We do focus on values and the faith motivations for lifestyle changes. You can see here a few quotes from faith leaders who, whom we're working with. Um, I'm just going to read out two. You can read the rest. Um, for example, Imam Zaid Shakir, who is a, really a leader on sustainable living in the US, a Muslim leader, says, Our prophet, peace be upon him, is a model of simplicity. One cannot claim to be a true follower if one does not strive to emulate his simplicity in living and doing without much. And um, a Catholic sister, Christina Tommy, says, In a society that glorifies excess and fears inconvenience, Eating a plant-based diet is a simple discipline that keeps me grounded and reminds me to keep making choices that respond to the urgent cries of our, of our earth, our common home. So we try to um, um, amplify those voices and those stories. You'll find some more here. Um, and we also um, want to uplift um, religious leaders who are making personal commitments to sustainable living. We really want to show that um, this is personal, tangible, actionable, and spiritual. And that's why we directly work with those religious leaders who become role models for sustainable living. We think that it's a strong opportunity for them and for us of influencing religious communities with their testimony and teaching. And I'm just um, selected, selected four commitments here, very tangible personal commitments. And it's not a signing a petition, but it's um, making a personal lifestyle change. So on the left, you see Bishop um, Ephraim Tendero, who's the Secretary General of the World Evangelical Alliance, a faith community that has only recently actually um, joined um, um, climate change action, advocacy and sustainable living efforts. And it's great that he, who is representing 600 million evangelicals, um, has committed to be uh, to a vegetarian diet and to power his home in the Philippines with 100% renewable energy. Next to him, you see Rabbi Jonathan Karen Black. He's the co-founder of the Jewish Ecological Coalition, committed to a range of sustainable behavior changes, including 
installing a solar array and purchasing renewable energy to power his home in Australia and eating meat only once each week. And I also want to present Gretchen Castle. Let me see on the right, I also have a woman here. She's the General Secretary of the Friends World Committee for Consultation. That's the International Office of the Quaker Community. She committed to purchase 100% renewable energy to power her home in the United Kingdom. And she says, the spiritual imperative I feel as a Quaker and as a Christian to love one another is at the heart of my life and my relationships with people and with the earth. And we think that sharing those commitments and sharing those personal testimonies really is powerful in communicating um, sustainable lifestyle changes. Lastly, we work with religious communities and grassroots com communities um, with the goal to establish and celebrate sustainable living together as a community. And that's another strength of religious communities um, who can do this together. Um, we have um, started this year in our first year with a, a global campaign that was called the Week of Living the Change. Um, that is actually a vital expression of this community or grassroots um, approach. We had about 100 local events in 25 countries. You can see on this world map in blue the countries or the communities um, that participated in certain countries. So it was really um, covering all, all continents. Um, we're very happy that we had um, participants from Global North and Global South um, organizing a sustainable living event and sharing in their community and, com and talking about sustainable lifestyle changes. I want to share a few stories just to give you a bit more appetite. So you see a few pictures here, again, um, referring to Adam, real people and real settings, that's really important. So those are the pictures they have sent to us. And I wanna share about um, um, the event in Haiti, one of the, actually the lowest carbon emitting country in the world who nevertheless worked, uh, worked on this topic. And they, um, um, Adeline Prophet, who is the minister in a Christian community there, he organized an event with 100 people, said, living the change must first start within the faith community to serve as an example for others. And you see that picture here on, on the left. And going down to this uh, group picture with the green background, that's in Lagos, Nigeria, and Douglas Omoroj, who organized an interfaith dialogue and commitment for planetary stewardship, said, we had a multi-faith meeting with people of all ages from four months to 74 years. The consensus was that we needed to start limiting the effects of climate change and flooding in Nigeria. The flooding, uh, the solution is also with us as we need to join together to push for sustainable lifestyles through focusing on every aspect of our lives in the way we consume and continue to consume, especially eating less meat, reducing our energy use and switching to renewables start the switch to green mode of transportation, for instance, like riding bicycles and even walking to work if it's not too far from home. Lastly, um, I'm sharing with um, the, you see some pictures here from Australia and Lysia Byrat with the Catholic mission in Sydney reported, many people committed to eating less meat, better recycling and composting, driving less and even engaging a stranger in this conversation. So with these examples, um, yeah, I wanted to give you some appetite for telling the story. And we truly think that um, storytelling is a big part of this because it is so personal. It is a spiritual issue. It should be tangible and it should be hopeful. So um, we have a large network to offer and um, really um, inviting uh, yeah, journalists on this call and partners and colleagues to make use of that faith network. Um, with the goal to tell these stories that really touch people and um, make, it, uh, make, make those stories um, reach out to people personally. So if we can help to connect you with them, to tell the story in the best way possible, please contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, we still have 10 minutes, so be ready for your super questions. Um, but first of all, I wanted to give Joel as well the opportunity because he has been speaking the least compared to the rest. Um, I know there were some questions um, to prepare this, this webinar, so I was wondering if you want to tell us maybe a bit more about how to select a good story, for example, like a 
hardcore journalist uh, perspective on how to find a good story? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, they've all, the, the panelists have all been great and they've all brought very interesting perspectives on this. Um, as, a, as a hard bitten old bitter journalist, it's, it's hard because a lot of these stories are rather, um, they're soft and they're personal and they deal with things that are very important, but that don't always get um, the attention they need. So, you know, like if I brought a story with someone putting up insulation, you know, a photo of someone putting up insulation to my photo editor, uh, they would probably just laugh. You know, that's not something that they're going to run because they want the polar bear. You know, they want the desert scene with the black, you know, with the ground all bleached off because that's dramatic. It's inherently dramatic, even though it's um, the insulation photo would, of course, carry more valuable information <laughs> and, uh, and would probably have a much greater impact on people's personal lives. So um, it's a difficult challenge to sell softer lifestyle stories, um, at least on to, to my publication. Well, we're so focused on these big, broad, global uh, science uh, stories that, um, that are far more dramatic and do have that sort of doom and gloom uh, character toward them. Um, and of course, that's not good either because it just leads people to throw up their hands and go, well, you know, we're fried. There's nothing we can do, so why bother? So the real challenge for us as journalists, as NGOs, as faith leaders, I think, is to, you know, not let that apathy set in, but to say, you know, this is our future. This is our children's future. Those things seem to respond. It's like when you can put it not just in my own personal story, but, hey, this is our progeny. This is what our kids are going to inherit. You know, this is part of our our, our moral stewardship of the planet, it's our moral duty to pass it on better to the next generation, um, then it becomes a lot more compelling. So um, I, it, it, it's a hard sell many times, but I think uh, what Marta said earlier was, was really good. You have to be um, transparent, you have to be trustworthy, you do not want to give a journalist bad information or they will never call you back. You know, they will, you don't want to burn anybody. Uh, you don't want to become too much of an advocate because then obviously you're, you know, you're going to be put in the camp in opposition of whoever you're advocating against. At least in the United States, we have this sort of sense of balance, or you, we used to, maybe not anymore, where you have to quote both sides. So picking out these stories and finding stories, um, uh, you know, that, that really translate climate into what people's lives are. I mean, there are several topics here, that some of which you've touched on. The diet, we cannot get enough food stories, whether it's, you know, the, uh, the old Cro-Magnon diet or, or vegetarianism. I've done some of my more popular stories have been on things like aquaculture. You know, sustainable food is just um, people are fascinated by it. Um, and so that is a wonderful entry point with beautiful photos. And people, you know, we have a whole entire food network in the United States that are good 24-7 just doing cooking shows, you know. People are crazed about what they eat. So having that as a nice intro, I think is great. Also for us, especially in the, in the science journalism community, having something that's really technologically interesting. You know, a Tesla is more interesting than a Prius, even though a Prius has the impact, you know, the potential to far more impact than the few thousand Teslas that get sold every year. But it spurs the interest in the new technology that helps us Create, will help us hopefully create sustainable lifestyles. So um, I'm an old editor from the Mother Earth News where we were doing solar panels back in the 70s and, and growing your own gardens and things like that. So all of these things I think are coming back in vogue. Um, and as people see not only um, the, the climate benefits, but the benefits to their bottom line, their power bills, uh, their grocery bills, um, I think that's a great way uh, to get people, um, get readers involved. You know, because it was that's my full um, my commitment is supposedly to the reader, right? To not to the advertisers, not to the publisher, but to help the reader and give them as much good information as I can. So um, yeah, I hope that helps. It does. Thank you. Really, it does. Um, so I'm gonna bring it to the questions which the public have been asking. Um, I have several ones, but feel free to send some more people who are watching us. Even if we don't have time to solve them now, we will direct them to the speakers and then, and then they will, you will receive the response anyway. Um, so I'm going to throw one at Adam. Um, there is someone from Guyana saying, 
is there any research yet on the impact of these changing visuals or is it too new? Um, how can we contribute to this database? Because uh, that person has some um, ideas of images and uh, of course, you, you see them like the, the images can be seen locally, but it's not something that is, mm. is picked up worldwide. Sure. And the, yeah, that's a good question. So we're always happy to consider um, new and fresh images for the, for the climate visuals library. And um, if you just send, send me an email afterwards, then we can, can have that conversation. We, you know, we, we use our climate visuals, the framework that we have from the research and we would assess any image in, in, in light of that framework to see if it, it fitted with what our research was saying. So that would be the process we would go through and then just find somewhere to link it, link it back to so people could access the image if it was, if it was for others to, to use and share. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of like the impact of the changing, well, of the things that we're advocating, I just, I just put a link into the chat actually, which is a BBC story today talking about the climate visuals resource. And I just put that in because it's obviously you know, journalists talking about this this idea, um, and and it and it and it and it kind of goes back to to some of some of Joel's points there. And I certainly don't underestimate how much of a challenge it is to kind of look at um, conventions and norms within the media or anywhere else and ask if they can be different. Um, but I, I guess it's a bit like for a long time we had this idea of kind of needing to present like where it was called false balance, right, on climate change, you know, on the one side, there's the climate consensus. On the other hand, you know, there's people think differently. And like a lot of media outlets and organizations have shifted away from that now, even though it is a convention. Um, and I think that maybe there's a similar challenge with the imagery. Um, like we have a shared responsibility. Like it's not just journalists, it's not just picture editors, it's the photo agencies, um, it's campaigners as well. But somewhere in the middle of all that, we all have a responsibility to, to tell a story that's going to compel action as well as just like, you know, make people go, Oh, polar bear climate change. Cause it doesn't tell people enough about what they can do or what it means. Um, so yeah, like we, in terms of impact, we've, we've collaborated with people like WWF and tier fund to influence their visuals and images. We've, we've, we've curated images for the IPCC's 1.5 degrees report, which is going to be on their new website when it's launched before the next cop. So we're starting to see this stuff come through now. Um, but, but for sure it's, you know, always a bit of a slow and challenging thing to be able to tell that, that story all the way through to the end. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're always looking to, to partner as much as we can with people who can make those changes. Thank you, Adam. That sounds great and really interesting. I'm looking forward to see how it looks with the IPCC report as well. Um, there's another question to Joel. Um, someone is saying, um, I am from Guyana and ExxonMobil recently found oil in the coast, uh, but I'm noticing they are already investing in media campaigns. Um, and there's not, uh, the person says there's not enough journalists questioning um, the track record of ExxonMobil and the ne negative environmental impacts. So if you have advice for that person, because it's the journalism student, um, to how to challenge ExxonMobil and the consequences that it could have for the country. Sure, this is a great question because this is one of the largest um, oil discoveries that's been made in the last few decades. It's, it's massive and there's going to be a lot of interest, not just from Exxon, but from a lot of companies off their coast. Now, what do these big oil companies do, like they do in the Arctic, they will go and uh, typically they will try to buy off local communities, people that are the squeaky wheel, whether it's uh, Eskimo whalers or artisanal fishermen. So uh, his challenge is going to be as a, as a, uh, aspiring journalists, uh, to start talking to these interest groups, making sure uh, that everything, every dime that Exxon spends is transparent. Make sure he can, you know, ask them to sign any kind of transparency thing, whether it's from the EU or whether Guyana has one, to make sure they know exactly where Exxon's money is going. Because it often lines the pockets of the politicians who are going to be uh, supposedly charged with policing their activities. Um, I'm not sure if that's something, it's so big, I'm not sure if that's something that they can stop or if they want to, because it will mean a lot of money for a, for a poor country. Um, but he, could, he should certainly try to hold their feet to the fire uh, to make sure they're doing everything in, uh, with the utmost care, which they don't always do where there's not supervision. They will cut corners, just like, I'm not Exxon specifically, but as we saw with BP, even the United States, uh, they will drill as quick and as fast and as cheaply as possible if they can get away with it. So the goal of any country and any concerned citizen is to make sure they can't get away with that. 
And uh, I think using the media tools that he has, if he's not tapped into the established journalism uh, outlets there, certainly using social media, that's shown to be very effective. If Exxon spills, if they start doing things that he can document, on offshore um, exploration is hard. It's hard to get access. You know, it's difficult to get out there, but if he can hop on a fishing boat and go out and take a look at it and see what they're doing, um, I would, uh, you know, without endangering himself or, or his friends, uh, that would be a good way to go. But um, connecting with global NGOs who are working on keeping the oil industry honest is, is also another, another good way to do it. Um, it's, it's a tricky deal. These things are, di are massive. Like they're like giant dinosaurs of the corporate world. Um, uh, but it can be done. It can be done. It just has to watch where the money goes, like all good journalists do. Thank you very much. I hope this encourages the research and trying to challenge Exxon in that case. Um, I think it's time to wrap it, wrap it up. I saw there were some more questions, so I'm going to forward them for sure um, so you have your response and you will receive this recording and then the amazing toolbox that they are preparing um, for you to have all these materials. Um, so thank you again, Joel, Adam, Marta Isabel and Caroline, that was really interesting and thank you everybody for listening to it. And of course, thanks for the, to the organizers, to CITSE, to the Global Catholic Climate Movement and to the Kiar Foundation who made this possible. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you again. I'm sure there will be more opportunities. Uh, and yeah, thanks again. And please, please, please keep writing and fighting climate change and any other sustainability issue. We want to see how this evolves in the future. Thanks so much and see you.